Welcome to a Creative Approach podcast. I'm your host, Karen Poirier Brody. Just the other day, my husband was looking at his tablet and found a tour of Ireland. He called me over and we checked the trip out and decided that it was not at the right time for us. We were in Great Britain and Ireland last year, and the advertisement attracted his eye because we had enjoyed our tour there so much. I realized that I had not continued with the tale of our adventure in the podcast I'd started a while back. I've been a bit under the weather lately and have put off a few things. I'm well now and an episode is due, so I thought it a perfect time to continue my story and let you listen to a fun interview I recorded on my trip where I ask a host manager of a hotel for information about Irish coffee. I am occasionally shy, which seems like an odd admission from a podcaster who's speaking to so many folk I don't know and interviewing some guests with whom I am not well acquainted. But on some occasions, like trips abroad, I can be shy. Maybe it's the unfamiliar environment and maybe traveling on a tour one never feels it's a personal party. Nevertheless, I'm glad I was bold enough to ask for the interview and hope you'll enjoy that bit of the story. I recommend to everyone to take some time to get to know local people on one's trips. Our visit was a bit of a whirlwind without much opportunity for that, but every time we did, even for brief chats, it proved to be some of the best part of the adventure. We woke reasonably early, but almost not early enough as we made it to the tour bus a minute late. That was a bit of a problem. Tours, especially the whirlwind globus one we were embarking on, are very demanding. Some excursions are arranged to avoid huge crowds, so it's important to leave on time. I would suggest you take that into account when visiting popular tourist spots in the high season and you're on your own. Try to be the first ones there at any major attraction. The group spent the first day touring the highlights of London, including Whitehall's Mounted Horse Guards and St. Paul's Cathedral. Cal and I had been to London before, but enjoyed the little tidbits of information our guide included, which gave us more insights on the sites. That day, we traveled to Windsor Station, which is a grand English Industrial Revolution Victorian style. Although much of it is no longer a train station, but is now a tourist mall. Naturally, we explored the grounds of Windsor Castle, which has beautiful gardens with lawns and roses and other lovely flowers. Of course, the gorgeous, impressive St. George's Royal Chapel is there. The meeting site of the Order of the Garter, and recently famous as the spot where Harry and Meghan will wed. The next day, we departed for Canterbury Cathedral. I had an urgent personal matter to take care of and a purchase to make, but scurried and made it to the cathedral. I'm glad I got there and took some photos of the Black Prince's stunning attire. Edward of Woodstock, known as the Black Prince, was the eldest son of Edward III, King of England, and Philippa of Hainaut. I have a family name, Hainaut, that I believe comes from the area of Europe, but it's not a royal connection. Still, it made me feel a link to some of my European roots. Edward fought in the early years of the Hundred Years' War and predeceased his father, so he never became king. His son, Richard II, followed Edward III. Our group moved fast, and no sooner had we toured the cathedral and a brisk walk across town than we were on our way through the pastoral countryside, dotted with buildings that had names like the Croft and the Old Mill. The farms and fields likely are much as they've been for centuries, except that electricity windmills tell you it's the present. Still, here and there, an ancient castle or grand stone church remind you of Great Britain's long and fascinating history. The bus ride took us to Brighton to tour the Royal Pavilion. The building and the town have the Georgian Regency flavor that delights me. I enjoyed it immensely. 
Brighton's row of Georgian to Victorian buildings look out on the beach, bathing huts, beautiful piers, and a promenade that had me envisioning Regency characters walking by the sea. We stayed in a lovely old hotel with all the flavor of the area. The next morning proved to be much more than I had expected. Stonehenge appears in so many travel ads of Great Britain that one feels whatever magic the Druids worked in such a place should be long gone. I was delighted to find that the incredibly huge crowds are well managed, and you can feel much of the wonder of the site in spite of being one of the masses. I did lose my favorite Ken Oliver color burst baseball cap there, but I gained a sense of the magic and the mystery of Stonehenge, despite my misgivings. It's a beautiful setting and very peaceful. You'd never know a major highway is not far away. I loved the haunting moors of Dartmoor National Park, where we headed next, and the cozy pub where we heard traditional storytelling. The stories were not all engaging, but the atmosphere was very much so. This place is an area of very ancient history that sometimes reveals itself in discoveries from the peat bogs. A somewhat dangerous landscape, though a fertile one, with eras of farming history. The next morning had us traveling in Cornwall in Poldark country. We viewed St. Michael's Mount later that day. Historically, St. Michael's Mount is a Cornish counterpart of Mont Saint-Michel in Normandy, France. The similarities are tidal island characteristics and conical shape, though St. Michael's Mount is much smaller than Mont Saint-Michel. It's still a cool sight to view. We then traveled to Land's End, the most western tip of Cornwall, and went to the seaside town of St. Ives, I think the grounds and ruins of the buildings at the Priory and St. Ives were so lovely and peaceful. That was one spot I wish we'd spent more time. I also remember a tea shop across from where the bus parked near the Priory entrance, and there we enjoyed a tasty morning bun and a pot of tea. Our guide then brought us on a tour boat for a cruise up Plymouth Sound to Plymouth and the site where the Mayflower and the Fortune set off to travel to America. I thought about that voyage 400 years ago of the Mayflower, which beginning reversed the cruise we had just taken. I think there must have been so much trepidation, but excitement and hope that the God the pilgrims believed in so fervently would provide for them. There are family ties in these ships on my husband's side of the family and possible connections in my roots. My eldest son's ancestors also hark back to the Mayflower in his father's ancestry. Hmm, I suppose it's the storyteller in me. I love using those old-fashioned words like hearken to listen or hark back to go to the source. I love the magic of language. That was one of the wonderfully pleasurable parts of the trip. We heard English everywhere, but with so many delightful accents. The other languages, Gaelic, Cornish, and Welsh, were all magic to my ears. Our group learned about King Arthur and Glastonbury, and a trip to Bath capped the day. I am a mad fan of Regency romance novels. There's something about Regency society that I find intriguing. It was full of people like you and me, operating under a set of impossible rules that somehow seemed sensible to most at the time. I always enjoy what authors do with that era. The bodice rippers are the reason many readers like the genre. The complexities of enjoying intimate Congress and Regency society is entertaining as well as titillating. It's always fascinating to read outstanding authors who take on this era. Mary Bela and Lisa Klapis are two authors that make the period come alive for me. As much as I like the category of literature, I'm quite sure I would not have loved living during that time. Bath, of course, next to London, is often the setting for a good Regency romance. It was also a place where Jane Austen lived. Now hers are books I read over and over. 
The Royal Crescent and the Circle, with the grand sweep of Georgian buildings, is a unique architectural delight. Bath also gives us a fascinating look into an outpost of Roman civilization. I'm currently enrolled in a course on Roman architecture at Coursera.org, so you know this was a significant stop on the tour for me. The baths are spectacular. The excavated treasures, the pump room, the engineering displays, and a chance to sample the waters were all fantastic experiences. Next stop was Wales, a land of low mountains, tidy farms, simple architecture, and signs with unpronounceable names. Wales is noted for its love of music, and the Welsh evening did not disappoint. We gathered at the Cultural Centre in Cardiff Bay and dined on an excellent meal of delicious food accompanied by glorious music. The troupe were extraordinarily talented, and not only had terrific voices, but were witty too. There was a good smattering of Tom Jones hits, but one of my favorite hymns, Bread of Heaven, that some also call Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, is based on an old Welsh tune and was beautifully sung. The next day, we bust through the countryside of Wales to cross St. George's Channel to Ireland. They tell you Ireland is green, and you say, oh, sure. You get there, and it's green, not just one green, but layer upon layer of beautiful greens. I loved it. And then a lovely old hotel. There I found the story of, and the recipe for, Irish coffee, which I was able to record with Jackie Cusick, the manager of the Granville Hotel at Magers Key, Waterford City, Ireland. Here's my conversation with Jackie. Hi, Kieran Poirier Brody here, and I'm at the Granville Hotel in Ireland. And I'm talking with Jackie Cusick, who's going to give us a little history on the Irish coffee. Hi, Karen. So, hi. So the history of the Irish coffee, as the Irish would say, is that it first originated in Foynes Airport, which is now known as Shannon Airport in Ireland, up in the west of Ireland. And how we said it originated is that one night in 1943, a flight was where well, passengers were heading to Botwood in Newfoundland. And they hit a storm or bad weather and the airport, pilot decided to morse code back to Foynes and he said that if the chef could have a hot meal and a hot drink ready for the passengers. So they got back to Foynes and the passengers alighted off the flight and Joe Sheridan who was the chef there in Foynes at the time decided that he would do a hot drink for them. So he did a, a coffee and he put a drop of Irish whiskey into it and that's how we say the Irish coffee was made but when the passengers came off a gentleman came along and said did you use Brazilian coffee and Joe said jokingly no it was an Irish coffee <laughs> so well, that's, that's our claim story. to fame great we've heard a little of the history of the Irish coffee so now I'm going to ask her if she could give us a little detail on how to make it correctly no problem well first off we would heat our glass with boiling hot water just so that the Sugar and the alcohol, which is the whiskey, will will combine easier. So first off, we would free pour. We don't use measures here in the Granville Hotel. We free pour our whiskey into the glass. And we would use, um, depending on how strong you'd like your coffee. I like mine strong, so I'd use two spoons of coffee in it. We use here in the Granville, we use instant coffee because of the, the volume we do. But you can use whatever coffee you'd like, your percolated coffee or whatever your favorite one is. So we, I, I like to put two spoons in, because I like it strong. And we would put in demerara sugar or brown sugar. Depending on how sweet you'd like it, you'd put in one or two spoons. Again, I like to not have it too sweet, and I put the one spoon in. And then you combine the whiskey and the coffee and the sugar, give it a nice stir, and then you put in your boiling water, up to three quarters full of the glass. Again, stir it again. And then we would top it off with freshly whipped cream. It's not sweetened, it's just freshly whipped cream. You use the same spoon that you have stirred your 
coffee mixture with, it's easier to put your cream back onto the, uh, into your coffee. And then that would be what we would call an Irish coffee. But as I said to people, it's a sin to stir your Irish coffee. So you have to drink it like you drink a pint of Guinness. You drink the black stuff through the white. And I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Thanks so much. No and yes, I love seeing that demonstration. <laughs> and I think you gave us a good picture of that. Mm. So folks, when you're trying it at home, remember, you can put in as much of the alcohol as you wish. And you don't have to just use whiskey. You can use Bailey's. Tia Maria, Kahlua, whatever your favorite tipple is. Yes, and whatever you prefer and as strong a coffee as you like. And, of course, if you use sweeter things, you use a little less sugar. Exactly. And um, you don't need to use, since you've already used sugar, you don't have to add sugar to your whipped cream. No, and, and you can also do a Bailey's, Bailey's coffee. And you don't have to put any sugar into it because the Baileys is nice and sweet. But if you're going to do a Baileys coffee, you'd only put in a little bit of coffee because it makes, if you put in too much coffee, it will make, actually make the drink look very dark. So if you want the nice Baileys color, just like one spoon of coffee would do. Ah, well, that's a good tip as well. So there you have it, folks. Um, a little bit of Ireland brought to you on this um adventure that I'm having and it is a creative approach to traveling to find good things to eat and drink. Thank you for listening. Show notes from today's episode of a creative approach podcast where you can learn more about my tour are available on the webpage www.acreativeapproachpodcast.com. Please join our creative approach Facebook page and group page two, where your questions and feedback on the show are welcome. Affiliate links for our show can be found at a Creative Approach podcast website. I hope you're a subscriber to a Creative Approach podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Thanks again for listening. Please join in future conversations where I hope you will find inspiration to make things, tell your story, and explore a creative approach to life.